This is a videotape statement of Lorenzo J. Gilliard of White Man 524 of 50 regarding the following homicides. Number one, Stacy Swafford. Next is the homicide of Gwendolyn Kazine. And next is Margaret Miller. Next is Catherine Berry. Next is Naomi Kelly. Next is Deborah Blevins. Next is Ann Barnes. Next is Kelly Ford. Next is Angela Mayhew. Next is Sheila Engel. That's the photograph of Catherine Barry, discovered 314 of 86 at 3001 Central. Those are your initials on the yes. bottom? Yes. Do you know Catherine Barry? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever seen her? Not to my knowledge. I would have remembered, no. Have you ever had physical contact with her? Not to my knowledge. She, too, was found, shoeless like all the victims, and placed in a sexually suggestive pose. Her body contained the semen of the defendant. And no one else. The crime started back in 1977 and spanned three decades. Women strangled between 1977 and 1993. First photograph I'm showing you is Sheila Ingold. Do you know Miss Ingold? Not to my knowledge, no, I don't. This is a photograph of Stacy Swafford. I didn't know her. Have you ever had physical contact? Not with to Ms. my Swafford? knowledge, no. Kelly Ford, have you ever seen Miss Ford? Not to my knowledge. Photograph of Connie Luther. <laughs> Not to my knowledge, no, I don't know her neither. You don't know her? No. Have you ever had physical contact with Not her? Not to my knowledge. Carmeline Hibbs, do you know Miss Hibbs? Margaret Miller has discovered 5 9 of 82, 37 at Garfield. Do you know or did you know Miss Miller? Not to, not to my knowledge, nope. Have you ever had physical contact with Miss Miller? Not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen Miss Miller? Nope, not to my knowledge. Carmeline Hibbs, do you know Miss Hibbs? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever seen Miss Hibbs? Not to my knowledge, no. Have you ever had any physical contact with her? Not to my knowledge, no. Nope. Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. I can't. Nope. I didn't know her. Nope. Not to my knowledge. Have you ever seen her? Not that I know. Not to my knowledge. We are Mo True Crime. I am your host, Dan Marie, and I love true crime. I am your co-host, Mark, and I hate true crime. We'll discuss old and new, solved and unsolved Missouri true crime cases. And sometimes we'll take a road trip or fly around the world to bring you a mystery from other parts of the world. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Mo True Crime. Please like us and share with your friends. This podcast is not suitable for children. Please use caution when listening around others as the subject matter can be upsetting. Hello, Amory. Where are we this week with Mo True Crime? Hey, Mark. We are in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri is the 37th largest city by population in the United States and the largest city in Missouri. Did you know that? I did not know that. I knew it was pretty decent size, yeah. I thought it was St. Louis. In 2016, the population was just over 481,000 people. And in 1970, which this story will take us back to 77, but, you know, decade 70 and then 80. So in 1970, the population was slightly larger at 507,000. So we are talking about Lorenzo J. Gilliard, aka the Kansas City Strangler, aka Garbage Man. He was born on May 24th, 1950. He is an African American serial killer with a victim count of 13. He was the first born of three. He's considered an organized lust, disorganized throw killer. He stands five foot eight and was raised by both parents. He didn't go past the 10th grade and does not have any degrees, so he didn't even get his, you know, high school degree. He was married several times and has 11 children with various girlfriends and wives. It was really hard to actually determine that to be true. It's mentioned in numerous articles that in some studies that he did have 11 children, but I don't have much more data than that on it. It is believed that he started killing at the age of 27. In 1967, at the age of 17, Gilliard married his pregnant girlfriend, Rena Hill married Gilliard in 1968 after she became pregnant. They divorced after what Hill described as five years of torture. He destroyed my life and now he's crept back. It's horrible. Hill agreed to be interviewed on the condition that she may be identified only by her maiden name. She was remarried and tried to put her life with Lorenzo behind her. Hill and Gilliard met in high school and attended dances together. She described him as fun, but changed when they were married. The physical and mental abuse was almost continuous. He beat me and raped me. He threatened me and said he'd kill me. Gilliard wouldn't let her use... So, can you... If you're married, can you technically rape someone? Are you serious right now? I mean... So, so what's the definition of rape? It's not consensual. One says no and the other says yes. Or something like that, right? Okay, say that again. What's the definition of rape? What do you think it is? 
when the other party says no and you still do it, right? Yeah, so does it marry that your wife says no and you still do it? Yeah, but don't you think that wife say, I, I got a headache tonight, something, 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 you know, they just lose interest or something, right? So does that mean... So it's okay for the husband I'm to still saying, be like, I don't well, care? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. What, what do you think? You're just starting to sound like Gilliard with the no. whole... I don't know, man. I don't know, man. <sighs> no, I'm just saying. So she would have to go down to the police station and say he raped me and filed charges against him, right? Yeah. And that's what happened. But well, so it says. This so is let his me first finish marriage. this art. Let me yes, let me finish this article because it, there's a reason why. Let me just finish this. So Gilliard wouldn't let her use all the rooms in their home. He loves night. This is a quote from her. He loves nice things, pretty things, but you can't use them. He made me live in one room, the bedroom, for five years. Hill has received psychiatric help for the abuse she suffered during the marriage, but her nerves have been bothering her since Gilliard's arrest. They interviewed her in 2004 when he was arrested. Yeah, but at some point... I don't think she ever filed... I don't know, because... At some because, point, she had to use the bathroom. Okay, so she probably wasn't kept in the room for five years. Well, you like to split hairs, so I don't think she meant she couldn't go to the kitchen or, you know, the bathroom. I mean, I've been in people's homes, think, and, and they'll have a sitting room. They don't like you sitting on the couch or anything like that. That's fine. I mean, there's nothing... I'm th I'm saying it's not predisposed just to something. He just liked stuff that maybe not touched. I'm not defending him or convicting him or anything, but don't you so think that? So do you think that she wasn't raped because he was married to her? No, I'm not saying that. I'm, I, I, I think that's... You started this out with, can you rape your wife? Can you, can you rape your wife if you're married? Uh, or rape someone if you're married? I mean... I. I don't know. I, if you get to that point, why are you married? What are you doing? You think that this is somewhat normal for married couples that they just, they've been married why, a while. Why wouldn't she want to have intercourse with him? Just one day, oh, I'm done and no more intercourse for you. And, but we're still going to be married. Well, as we, as we get into him and, and his behaviors, I mean, he's a very violent person. He has a temper and he's violent. Against women. Okay, so, so you don't these think... rapes happened and these killings happened while they were together, right? He he had a, he married again, right? Yes, he did. And he had several, you know, wives and girlfriends. And I think when he was married, he had girlfriends. And clearly, he would see prostitutes because all of these victims, except for one, are prostitutes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's clearly not faithful whether he's married or in a relationship with someone. Right. So I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters if he's married a year or married five years or married 10 years. He should never take anyone by force. And he's very controlling, obviously. Okay, so you're making these statements about him that he has a violent temper and he's controlling. I don't know. Okay, let's keep going. It, I mean, she specifically said the physical and mental abuse was continuous. I mean, he admitted in the interview with Piers Morgan that he hit, would hit his wife. He admitted that. He said, I'm not going to lie. I hit her. I mean, he, he admits to being abusive. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a, a tough discussion because people get mad. Right? You don't know how it's like on the other side either. But how many people do you know that get mad? That hit someone else or physically hurt someone else, whether it's stabbing There's them a lot of or I mean, strangling. You know, I don't care. Up, kids, I'm asking you if you think that that's like the norm. Like you think all these married couples get to a point in their relationship where they fight and they get physical. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot that, that do. They may not say it, but I think there's a lot. I so mean, you think passions that's normal. run wild. So you think it's normal? I think it's part of human nature that both sides will strike out right some people i think close down mentally and other people use other methods to express their frustration and that can be many things it can be mental and physical okay i've never gotten so upset in a relationship that i've physically harmed someone 
I've always been able to control my emotions. And I think most people can, especially grown adults, you know? Yeah, but how many... How many times is a, a cop's called out every single day about somebody but physical I violence I, I every day? No, I, I agree Hundreds with you. Hundreds of thousands every freaking day. But I don't think that's the norm. I think that's the the. We like to think that we can control ourselves, but when you're in the heat of the moment and you're passionate about something, and this goes for both sides, right? Men and women. You know, women have struck men as well and men have struck women i'm not denying that but i don't think it's as common as you think for someone to lose control in an argument and to be physical i think in your culture in different communities it's much more prevalent than what you think i think some people live in maybe sheltered environment but if you go into a different area and you're raised differently you're fighting you think i was sheltered uh i think for some things yeah if you didn't if you didn't experience some physical violence growing up then you were probably sheltered because i think it happens it's not always reported i think different communities they don't report it they just go on and it's a you know it's a masculine thing that you're overlooking. So he did get married when in, in 1968 he would have been 18 years old, but he got married in when he was 17. So so this is a very young man, very young, and maybe sound like a troubled home life, right? His father was. We're getting to that. We haven't gotten to that far yet. Okay, so keep so actually keep he's, going. his his father is next. Actually, in 1970, his father was arrested and convicted of rape. He served six months in prison. His father? Yes, for rape. And then in 1974, so he would have been 24, Gilliard was arrested for twice for rape. In February, he was accused of raping a 25-year-old exotic dancer at 27th and Troost Avenue. You'll hear Troost Avenue a lot in this case. It comes up a lot. The victim identified him in a lineup but prosecutors never obtained a conviction. And I'm wondering if that's because they thought maybe she wasn't a credible witness because she was a stripper. Yeah, I don't know why she wasn't. There could have been a whole bunch of circumstances why she wasn't a credible but this witness. But this is the 70s. I'm not sure that from 74 to now that many attitudes towards prostitutes and strippers have changed. I think they've become more seen in our daily life and it's become they a little are? more you see them every day no i mean like <laughs> do you visit them actually i don't no i mean it's it's you know you see strippers and and nudity and that kind of thing more in in movies and so what are you saying the they're media. more credible now no I'm, I'm not i'm saying that i think in 74 and now that they're seen in a different way because of their profession prostitutes strippers i mean i think they're all I don't know how much since 74 the attitude towards them has changed in terms of law enforcement. Mm. I mean, right? I don't know. I mean, I think it's every job's, every prosecutor's job to discredit or every lawyer's job to discredit the other side somehow. So, But it was probably found a way. Might be his drugs or something. Who, you know, if yeah, it could have been. Maybe she lied, right? She had some other stories that she tried to make up. And they said, well, I don't know how much other evidence they had other than just her being an eyewitness to saying, yeah, this guy raped me. But, you know, even in the 70s, rape was not taken very seriously. Even his dad in 1970 served six months for rape. And so it, it just wasn't, I think men were believed over women on rape and domestic violence and I'm not sure we've come much further the today in today, like in 2018. Yeah, so I still have it's it's yeah. I think there's a whole scope of issues when you go down that path. Where you know it doesn't take much when when somebody says rape or something like that. That's kind of a big deal. I know, right? but I don't. I don't it's know. Like, I don't. I don't think that is as let go as it used to be. If somebody says rape now, I think it's taken much more serious than if somebody said said rape. 
probably back in the 70s. Absolutely. Especially a, especially a married couple, right? Absolutely. But but in this case, he had some other charges from people that he was not married to. Not yet. We're getting there. No, I mean I mean this one So this was 1974 in 75. Yeah, but 74 this rape he wasn't married to her. He was arrested twice for rape in that year. Twice. But these were not his wife. No. Right. So so now he's got this. I don't. I don't think this he, history. They were only married for five years. So what does that make? Seventy three. Yeah. Yeah. By seventy four, he was already divorced. Right. It could have been a girlfriend. It could have been a friend. I mean, I I don't have a whole lot of details in this from the seventies. Right. We get a lot more details coming up in nineteen seventy five. He was living with a female friend in an apartment. He raped and beat her 13-year-old sister, but was only charged with sexual molestation and served nine months in jail. A rape charge was not. They dropped the rape charge and just did child molestation. So he actually got more than his dad did for raping someone. Yeah, but this is a underage issue, right? So this, this goes into a totally different criminal matter i think i don't know i'm not a friend it was his Doesn't friend's matter. sister under age right like and, and in the 70s age. there wasn't you know sex offenders or the registered sex offenders so he wasn't registered as a sex offender because this was way before that whole program i know but she, yeah but he, you know it's still a minor and what's your point I, it's, I think it's a it, you get a different sentence because of the age of the victim you oh. say it was longer than her, his dad or whatever served for what he did but the when he did to the woman, it was a, a you know an older woman. Well, it's also a different charge. His dad was charged with rape, and he was charged with sexual molestation. In April of 1977, Stacy L. Swafford is found dead, face down in a vacant lot at 45th and Euclid Avenue. Stacy was 17 years old and a young girl who was lost. The last time her parents saw Stacy alive was on Easter in 1977. She had left home several months before and was living on the streets in Kansas City and working as a prostitute. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Her mother, Georgine Swafford, was inconsolable after her daughter's death and died at home in 1994 of acute alcohol poisoning. In 1979, Gilliard was accused of kidnapping a couple, raping the woman while holding her boyfriend hostage at gunpoint. The boyfriend picked Gilliard out of a lineup. Hairs from the victim were found in the building where Gilliard worked as a maintenance worker, but... Dumbass jurors acquitted him of rape in September of 1980. Later in 1979, Gilliard was convicted of aggravated assault for threatening to shoot his third wife. So he's already had another marriage from 1968 to 79. He's already been married three times. He's on his third marriage, yeah. He's on his third marriage, yeah. So he was um, convicted of aggravated assault for threatening to shoot his third wife. She divorced him in 1981. The next month, Gilliard attacks his now ex-wife, once beating and pistol whipping her in one attack, and in another attack, he broke out her front teeth and stabbed her in the arm with an ice pick. He was convicted of third-degree assault for each assault. However, he only received probation. So we're going to see a lot of him doing something really terrible and horrible and not going to jail. Mm. In 1980, Gwendolyn Kazine, a 15-year-old black female, was reported missing on January 22, 1980, and was found dead the next day behind a building at 1312, the Paseo, by a neighbor going to work. Gwendolyn is the youngest victim. She was found with wire wrapped around her neck and wrists. She was clothed, but without shoes. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Gwendolyn was working as a prostitute on Troost Avenue. She had not been seen for over a week. In November of 1981, Gilliard was sentenced to four years in prison for second-degree burglary. I don't have a lot of information on what he did to get this charge. And case that unfortunately does not go back to this particular charge. There are some older ones, but this 1981 charge is not listed on case net. And I can't find a lot of information, so I'm not sure exactly what he did there. But that did finally get him, you know, a prison sentence. On May 9th, 1982, the body of Margaret J. Miller was found dead in a vacant lot near 37th and Garfield Avenue by a teenage student walking to his grandmother's house. She was a 17-year-old black female, and police reports indicate that her underwear and a bra with a key attached were not recovered. Margaret was working as a prostitute on Troost Avenue. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Eight days later, on May 17th, 1982, Gilliard begins serving his four-year sentence. Oh, so he wasn't in prison when <laughs> this other person was killed 
No, he had not gone to prison yet. Hmm. In 1983, Gilliard's sister, Patricia Dixon, was working as a prostitute in Kansas City. She fatally stabbed a customer 11 times in a dispute over $35. She received a life sentence for second-degree murder, but served only 10 years. She was also charged with murdering a fellow prostitute, but those charges were later dropped. So now we've got his dad in prison for rape, you know, serving a prison sentence for rape. His sister is now, she received a life sentence, but got out in 10 years. And you'll learn about his brother soon. Also in 1983, Gilliard is released from prison on parole on January 10th, 1983, but quickly returned for violating the terms of his release. He also received a four-year sentence for making a bomb threat. Again, I don't have a whole lot of information on this or the circumstances or why he even did that, but that keeps him in jail a little longer. But he is released in 1985. Gilliard is released again and began working for Deffenbaugh Disposal Service in the maintenance department. His father also worked there. Gilliard started on January 2nd, 1986 on the back of a trash truck. He worked his way up to driver and two years later was promoted to supervisor. Coworkers only had nice things to say about him. He was respected by his peers, reliable, friendly, and a helpful person. And on the Pierce Morgan interview, they, they interview one of his co-workers. And he only had, really had nice things to say to him until he started talking about him actually being the Kansas City Strangler. Right. And that's when he thought, you know, how could he be living? When was that these Pierce two... Morgan interview? When did he do that? What year? Do you remember? Mm, the year he interviewed him? Yeah, it was only like a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago because I think when I watched it, we're talking about the show that Piers Morgan does called Serial Killers. I, I think I watched it maybe last year, mm. so maybe 2017 or 2018 that he was interviewed. I'm thinking 2017 is when he was interviewed, but people knew in 2004 that it was him. He just hasn't ever publicly spoken. Right, it's the first time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's been very quiet. On March 14th, 1986, Catherine M. Berry, a 34-year-old white woman, was found dead in an abandoned building near 30th and Central Streets. Catherine was the mother of three children, and after the birth of her third child, she became mentally unstable and started to live on the downtown streets of Kansas City. She would spend nights in a homeless shelter, and she was not working as a prostitute, but would walk the street to preach to people about God, and she would accept rides from strangers. Her body was discovered in a public works building with a nylon stocking around her neck. She was covered with leaves and an autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. She's actually the only one that was not either sexually abused or sexually active right before she died. And she's also the only one that was not a prostitute out of all 13. Yeah, but in that Pierce Morgan interview... They interviewed her daughter, who was 16 at the time of her death. Th there was sperm on the leg. No, it wasn't her. It was a different one. Oh, it was a different one? It wasn't her? Cause they oh, didn't was find it? it? Yeah, I think it was. Oh. Right? Isn't that what that said? But it, but they didn't find it in her. It was just on her leg. Yeah. Ew. So he probably... Ew. Oh, man. That's gross. I mean, I, I don't know what happened, but... <laughs> just what I heard. Oh, I'm glad you were paying more attention than I was, because I watched it twice. <laughs> yeah, it was the only one, right? All these other ones he went through, all these other ones had... The semen in them and then the she bed, just yeah, had yeah. it on the and he's it's actually on the, the one i thought that was kind of odd because he's the act because he called it out he said oh it's 13 no it's 12 right then you say something like it's 12 and then she said she just had it one. on her leg yeah something like that yeah yeah right wasn't that right yeah if that's so right. creepy i mean i you thought have a link was... on that on motrucrime.com is that on motrucrime.com yes i will have that? a link to that you can it, you, it was up until a little while ago. It was on Netflix, but I did look for it, and it's not there. So How'd you find it? Was YouTube? it on Vimeo? Or, I can't remember where I saw it, but I'll put a link up to the actual episode. It's about 45 minutes where you can watch the whole thing. Six months later, the body of Naomi Kelly was found in a city park at 10th and Harrison. Naomi was a 23-year-old black single mother of two, and at the time of her death, she was attending a business school in downtown Kansas City trying to better her life for herself and for her two children. She was found with a towel tied around her neck and her face. She was found by a man drinking alcohol in the park. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Naomi was working as a prostitute on Troost Avenue. Four months later, still we're in 1986, four months after Naomi, they find the body of Debbie Blevins. She was found in bushes outside of Hyde Park Christian Church at 38th and Wyandotte Street. Debbie was a 32-year-old white female. She had a 9-year-old daughter at the time of her death and was addicted to drugs. She was working as a prostitute on Troost Avenue. Debbie had no clothes on when she was found, but was wearing a pair of pink socks. 
She was found after someone called the police to report a suspicious person in the bushes. The autopsy revealed her cause of death was strangulation. On April 17, 1987, the body of Anne Barnes was found at 13th and Lydia Avenue. Anne was a 36-year-old white female. Her body was found by a passing pedestrian, and she was lying on her back. An autopsy revealed her cause of death was strangulation. Barnes was working as a housekeeper at St. Mary's Hospital as well as an exotic dancer, and she was also a prostitute on Main Street. It's been exactly 10 years since victim Stacy Swafford was found on the day Anne Barnes's body was found, which is kind of weird. Yeah, but so, all right, so you're going through all this timeline. These are when they were found. This is not necessarily when they, they were killed. No, he he left them in areas like they weren't like decaying for months on end. Mm. Like, no, they were found within a week or something. A day. Disappearance. A a day or two that they were found. So, yeah, these aren't these aren't women that have been. I thought that, too. But these are not women that have been. That one was found under the board. Yeah, but apparently it was within like a day Mm. because her arm was sticking out. They have a picture on the serial killers episode and it looks like he tried to cover with leaves and then a like a board but her arm is sticking out yeah and i don't think so in he this didn't try area, to hide him at all most of them no i think he's she's pretty much the only one that he really tried to hide on june 9th 1987 the body of kelly a ford was found in roanoke park at 1300 west valentine road kelly was a 20 year old white female a woman walking her dog found kelly's body at the foot of a bluff She was nude except for a white sock on her right foot. She had a silver cross earring in her left ear and needle marks on her arm. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Kelly was working as a prostitute on Main Street. So there's a couple that are from Main Street, but most are from Truce except for Catherine Berry. No, they were known to be working on those. No, Uh, that's not where they're found. I'm telling you where they're found. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. On September 12th, 1987, the body of Angela Mayhew was found in the 2600 block of Genesee Street. Angela was a 19-year-old white female. She was found face down on the side of the road. Her socks and shoes were the only clothing missing from her body, which was found by a passing motorist. Hairs recovered from her turquoise sweater were what connected her to the other victims. So isn't, isn't it weird? All these, their socks are still on. Well, it's that's like the thing with him roll. is every one of his victims, so all 13 didn't like victims. 30 feet or something, huh? Well, all, like th- yeah, but feet. that's the weird thing, though. Like None of them has shoes on. That's one well, of the things socks. they always mention about him. I know. So he didn't like he didn't like dirty feet. Yeah. But not all of them had socks on. Some of them were missing their socks. They were nude. We said nude except for socks. Like two of them. Yeah. I guess it's the third one. Anyway. But why didn't he want the shoes? He had to get the pants off. You got to take the shoes off. Get the pants off. Oh um, dang! Yeah. Okay. Hairs recovered from her turquoise sweater was what connected her to the other victims. There was no sign of sexual assault. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. They don't have semen on her. Is this his last her. one? No. no. No, 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 no. We're not there yet. But the way that they connected him to her was hairs found on her body that matched other crime scenes. On November 3rd, 1987, the body of Sheila Ingold was found inside a van that was parked outside an auto repair shop at 3740 Truist Avenue by someone that was interested in buying the van. Sheila was a 36-year-old white female, and an autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. At the time, Sheila Ingold worked as a prostitute on Truist Avenue. Sheila always wore a gold ring on her left pinky finger and a silver wedding ring with a fake diamond on her left ring finger. Both rings were missing when her body was found. On December 19th, 1987, the body of Carmeline R. Hibbs was found in a second-story parking lot at 3560 Broadway by a motorist. Carmeline was clothed but missing her shoes. See, she had clothes on. Socks, too, right? It doesn't mention socks, but it says she had no shoes. Carmeline was a 30-year-old white female. She was working as a prostitute on Main Street. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. So now we're going to skip a year. So 1988, I don't have anything really recorded as having happened or linked to him or linked to him yeah on february 12 1989 the body of helga kruger was found helga was a 25 year old white female she was nude and lying face down with a paper towel in her mouth and ligature marks around her neck extensive bruises and abrasions to her body an autopsy revealed the cause of death was asphyxiation which same thing as strangulation mostly the crime lab linked dna to her from Kruger to Gilliard. It is assumed she was a prostitute because she had citations of solicitation. Mm. She had moved to the Miami area from Innsbruck, Austria in the mid 80s, and then she moved to Kansas City in 1987. Detectives have been unable to contact anyone that knew her. 
1989, Gilliard's brother, Daryl, murdered a friend in a drug deal, and he was sentenced to life without parole. So he's actually in jail still to this day. One night, Lorenzo Gilliard Jr. helped a neighbor load a bicycle into her car and later invited her in for an omelet dinner in his home. After three or four glasses of wine, Gilliard reached across the table and began pulling at the woman's top, saying he wanted to see her breasts. She recoiled and backed through the studio apartment, landing on a bed and Gilliard straddling her waist. I kept telling him all I wanted to do was go home, the woman said later in a deposition. The entire time, Gilliard said that he was going to kill himself. The woman recalled, Gilliard took a kitchen knife and placed it at his throat and then at hers. Afterward, he let the woman leave, records show. She immediately called the police. Authorities charged Gilliard with forcible sodomy, sexual abuse, and assault. The case appeared... So he raped her. Yeah. The case appeared headed for trial, but Gilliard pleaded guilty to everything except the sodomy charge on October 30th in 1989. The victim agreed to the plea bargain because she did not want her mental health history debated before a jury. According to a transcript of the hearing, she did not want to admit in court that she had been drinking before the incident. The deal had something for Gilliard, too. He was placed on probation for three years and was required to seek counseling for sexual abuse and anger control. The victim supported the plea agreement. So once again, no jail time. In 1991, after living in Missouri and Los Angeles with Jackie Harris, they were married on May 29, 1991. The pair lived in L.A. for a year before returning to Missouri. There have been no connections of any murders in L.A. to him. So there's nothing in the database in L.A. that connects, you know, to Gilliard. On January 11, 1993, the body of Connie Luther was found in a snowdrift by a passing motorist. She was found with a shoestring tied around her neck at 25th and Allen Terrace. Connie was a 29-year-old white female. An autopsy revealed the cause of death was strangulation. Connie was working as a prostitute on Main Street at the time of her death. Hmm. And this is what everyone thinks law enforcement think this is the last time he kills is 1993 in 1995 one of gilliard's other neighbors also had troubles with him according to court records gilliard approached the woman in september of 1995 and began describing intimate details about her she began to suspect that he was stalking her for months gilliard made unwanted advances that included lewd gestures the neighbor reported in court filings i have pointed out to him that he is married to which he simply so when did he get married again how long has he been married now in 1985 1991 he married jackie in 1991 Uh, so about four years i think jackie was like the The one one. the last one and i think he was the one i mean in the interview he gets really upset when pierce brings up jackie and even says i wish you wouldn't have brought her up and you can just tell the like look on his face like his whole his kind of facial expression changes when he hears the word jackie so i think that really hurt him and i'm thinking well we can talk about it later but she might be the reason why he stopped killing too because he marries, I mean, clearly he he still murders someone when he's with her, though, because they got married in 91, and then they lived in, so in 92, they got married in 91, they lived in LA in 92, and then they come back, and in 93, he kills Connie Luther. Mm-hmm. Anyway, for months, Gilliard made unwanted advances that included lewd gestures, the neighbor reported in court filings. I pointed out to him that he is married, to which he simply shrugs and indicates that what his wife doesn't know won't hurt her. The neighbor wrote in court records, Gilliard tried to act like a friendly neighbor by bringing her wine or firewood, she said, but I felt there was a control game at issue here. She answered her doorbell one early morning and found Gilliard standing there with the newspaper, she said. He eyed me in his robe and made an obscene sexual gesture. I yelled, I'm not interested. Other times she saw him looking in her window, she said, and she saw and she twice saw him lurking outside her rented house at night as a deaf single woman living alone. I fear for my safety and security in my home. In July of 1996, the neighbor filed for an order of protection and then moved out of town. Penny Bradley said that she and her husband were moving a new television into their home in the fall of 2001 when they backed a truck into Gilliard's driveway. He came out and confronted them about being on his property, which is marked with signs that warn against trespassing. A sign posted on his large tree in Gilliard's front yard says, Private driveway, do not enter. Which, by the way, this, this driveway is like 100 feet. I mean, how long no. do you think that that driveway is not long? No, right. I, I agree. It's not long. I mean, you really have to put like a private driveway. It's at the it's yeah, at the end of a dead end yeah, street. Right, but why is the guy on this property though? Well, he was he was trying to back the truck into his, so he so he pulled forward. Like my neighbors do it all the time. They drive on your yard. No, it didn't say yard. What they went say? into his driveway, and he freaked out. Oh. Because his driveway's right across. So yeah. In there and then back so in. he would pull in there and then back in his yeah. truck. Yeah. I mean, my neighbors okay. do that all the time across. The, yeah. So 
I mean, but I'm, but I'm saying it's like he has a sign up that says private driveway, do not enter, <laughs> like a tiny little driveway. Well, because everybody probably goes down that street. And turns around yeah. because it's a dead end. Yeah. Oh, yep. You nailed it. Um, so her husband then went inside Gilliard's home to talk, Bradley said. While there, Gilliard displayed two guns. The couple filed a police report. Other neighbors confirmed that the Bradleys had reported to them that they had trouble with Gilliard. Bradley, though, said she seldom saw Gilliard or his wife. In 2004, detectives started following Gilliard starting on April 12, 2004, after DNA linked him to 12 murders. They wanted to ensure public safety while tying up loose ends. For five days, Gilliard went to work early, came home early, and spent most of his time in his home on Kenwood Avenue. Detectives became convinced that Gilliard knew that they were following him, and on April 16, 2004, they quietly walked into a Denny's restaurant to where Gilliard was eating and asked him to come with them. Gilliard was there on a Friday night with a female co-worker from Death and Baugh Disposal Service. Detectives briefly questioned her and then sent her on her way. They later found out that Gilliard had no idea they were following him. <laughs> so I guess they got, they thought he was spooked. Well, he was just doing like normal stuff. Yeah, but they thought for some reason... That he figured it out. On April 17th, 2004, Gilliard was charged with 10 counts of first degree murder and two counts of capital murder. There are at least 15 victims that Gilliard is suspected of killing. All the victims were shoeless, posed, and most were nude. Six victims had items tied around their neck. The killer had used a shoestring, clothing from a victim, electrical cord, or anything else handy to strangle them. He's organized in a way that he knows what he's going to do and how, but he's disorganized in that he just grabs whatever he can. He doesn't take anything with him, you know. He doesn't He doesn't take... No, that one time he did, right? He took the ring. Missing the ring. No, I'm saying to strangle them. He doesn't bring something to strangle them. Oh. He just uses whatever, either yeah, something the they're wearing or something he can grab. Right. His first victim was killed in 1977, and the last known victim was killed in 1993. Where'd they get the 15 from? Because Pierce... We're getting there because... Yeah, there's only actually 13 for sure, but then there's two that they suspect. suspect, and he's only charged with six. So he's not even charged with the full, like, 13. His first victim was killed in 1977, and the last known victim was killed in 1993. It wasn't until 2001 that a connection was made that two unsolved murders of two females had been linked with the same DNA profile that was found on them or in the victim. So basically, there was two murders. So in 2001, they linked two crime scenes together and said the the same same person person, the same person did both of these crimes but they didn't know at that point who that person was but they had linked the two this is a cold case yes it's a cold case so they linked so those two linked them together at that time so in 2001 at the time that they had linked them they had 75 the crime lab had 75 dna samples from potential suspects then in april of 2004 i know they mentioned on serial killer with Pierce Morgan that they got a grant. So I guess they didn't have the money to do the extensive testing on the 74, which is actually quite sad if you think about it, because for three years they really had all the stuff they needed to solve it. But anyway, they got a grant and were able to start, I guess, testing some of these old cold cases. And they found a suspect whose DNA matched the evidence of 12 crime scenes. Mm. So how did they get his DNA in the first place? Because he was in the database in 2001. So in 1987, when police were investigating the death of Sheila Ingold, now a reminder, she was the one found in the van. He was a suspect at that time. Because the owner of the dealership had somebody come in and inquire in particular about that van, right? Well, no, he had. He had. And that day wasn't. No, that day he was over at the fish market. There's a, the day that her body was found. Yeah. But remember, he said she was a friend of someone he was friends with. He was dating. He was, I don't know if he was, he just said a friend. I don't know if he was, I don't know if he was dating her. It was like a friend of a friend, Sheila was. And then he had inquired about that van. Mm -hmm. And the guy that owned the the car dealership remembered that he had asked. And then it just so happened that he was at the fish market across the street the day that she was found, which is a lot of serial killers do that. They'll come back and they'll either come back to a crime scene or they'll be in the group of people that are watching it all unfold when the cops are there. You know, I mean, that's you think that's so? not you yeah, think he was at the new. other scenes i don't know if he was at the other scenes but he definitely was there and he admitted to that that's one of the very few things that he does admit to that yeah i was there well, at the fish market the, the day you might, guys found our body guy, yeah he thought the guy might place him there the guy that runs behind the thing so he could have been caught in a lie 
Oh, yeah, true that. So he was questioned at that time. In 1987, he was questioned about Sheila's death because he was at the fish market, because he had asked the guy, the car dealership guy about the van. So at that time, oh, and because, you know, she was a friend of a friend. So in 1987, they got blood and I think he said hair, right? Blood and hair. So they got a blood. Saliva. No, that was in 2004. So they got a blood and hair sample from him in 1987 and they actually, it sat on a shelf in a, in a cooler. Yeah, but he said for 15 they years. destroyed it. He did. He said that. In yeah, 19- but I, I think, but then Pierce brought up, well, you were booked again in, you know, when they picked you up again and thought it might have been you. Didn't they get some fresh stuff? Yeah, in 2004. They mm-hmm. did, right? Yeah. But that sample that they got in 1987 is what caught, what, what matched up to all those crime scenes. It wasn't in, so they bring them it, in, again in 2001, they made it. a match and it was from that 1987 sample. So that's how they got his DNA in the first place. Basically, in 2004, you know, his, his, for 17 years, he had been murdering women and it had come to an end. However, it still boggles my mind that in he stopped. In 1993, it came to an end, right? Yeah. No, in 1993. 1993, right. But why did he stop for 11 years? I mean, he was that entire time married to Jackie. I mean, was it Jackie? Is it because he was 54 years old? Maybe he, like, you know. Gave it up. But that's not really that. I don't know. That just. Do you think he gave up prostitution in general? I mean, that's what I'm. Cheated on her, Jackie. Well, I mean, he killed someone that was that had his semen in them in 1993. Yeah, so he married her in 1991, right? Yeah. So it's two years. So it was the last one in '93 that they know of, which I just find that highly unusual. But then again, if you look at people like um, oh, what's his name? The, the Air Force guy in Canada stole women's underwear and then started killing them. He was in his 50s before he ever like, committed a murder. I mean, he's yeah. he went his whole life not killing yeah. anyone and then started killing people like uncontrollably. This guy, he was about 30, wasn't he? His first murder? No, he was 27. Mm. Yeah. That we know of. I mean, who's to say he hasn't committed a lot more and just didn't, you know. Well, because I think they probably run this stuff through databases, right? No, but I mean, I'm I saying. I guess if they didn't find evidence on him. That's what I'm saying. I mean. But if he, but if, if he does, does the same thing, he leaves his semen in him. You know, he does the deed and then he kills him. When they find that body, what do they do? They, they go looking for that. I know, right? but what I'm saying is. I don't think serial killers kill the exact same way every single time. You know, there's things that happen. It was like literally the exact same thing every single time. So what about he's not taking these women home and killing them and dropping them off. He's doing everything in one place. How do you know? He's he, Well, he's he's picking them up and then he's on driving the them somewhere where he's ki- also killing them. You don't think he takes them back to his house? No. Does the deed. And then drops them. No, I think he picks them up and then takes them to a spot, and that's where he had sex with them. I think it's consensual. Most of the time, well, I think it's consensual. Yeah, I think it's right. consensual, and then he kills them where he where All they're right, so found. He, he went from raping. I don't think he's moving them. Is what I'm saying. I think he's doing everything, and then or maybe it's even in the car, and then dumps them. But I don't think there's. So what I'm saying is... Yeah, he probably wouldn't bring him back to his house as neat no. as he was, right? He probably... No, and I think he hates women. No, I, well, I think there's something there. So he went from raping to prostitution, it sounds like. To killing prostitutes. Yeah, but but he's go, he probably had prostitutes before he started killing them. You right? think he his was whole, going and, to prostitutes and not killing them? and stuff like that, and his dad, he had the, the, there was this whole rape thing going on, right? So then he thought, well, I can go have sex with these prostitutes... And, and do whatever, just pay him the money, and then they can't claim rape on me. He probably doesn't want the rape charge. He has this problem with the sexual deviant type thing, right? So he well, moved from the rape to treating, you know, to the women. Okay, so these women, it's consensual. Like you said, it's consensual because I paid for it so I can get it. They can't say rape to me. Well, that's that's interesting and all, but I think it's much more, I think it's much simpler than that. In that he is a sexual deviant and he goes to prostitutes and then he yeah. hates himself and there's guilt that he is paying a woman to have sex with him and he kills him because he loves and hates it. He, he hates. Yeah, but it's got to be more than that, I think, because 
He had a wife. He was married when he was killing some of these women. Yeah, but he also had a wife for five years that he raped. I don't think she yeah. was willingly wanting to have sex with the dude because right. it sounds like right. bad but shit. But he can find these women that are and just pay them. That's what I'm saying. But then he would feel guilt because he thinks he's above them. Would these women have sex with him if he wasn't paying them? No, they no. wouldn't. Right, right. It's guilt. It's a matter of guilt at that point that, yeah, that I just Morgan had to pay someone to even, have sex with them. And if an anger, but, I'm going to kill you. He equates it to the same thing. Remember in that, in that interview, the, the thing was, he said, you know, you go out to dinner, you buy them dinner and stuff like that. Isn't that the same thing? Isn't that it, you're buying them? It's not the same thing. I'm not saying it is. but I know, but I. That's in his mind. Right. So he. So I don't know if it's necessarily above. His it's wife, the same thing. They just can't but, say it's right. But I think that he thinks his wife, if he's paying for dinner and he's taken her out for a night on the town or whatever, yeah, yeah. that they should have sex with him. And I think some right, women think will be like, you know, some obviously his first wife did not want to have sex with him at some point, And he so he started to forcefully take her and abuse her and emotionally abuse her and break her down. Maybe Jackie was into his like, you know kink or something and she satisfied that in him i find that highly unlikely i don't think that someone that kills women for what 17 years and is a sexual deviant and then meets this person and everything's fine like so do it doesn't think, make do you sense think prostitutes are sexual deviants i think that most I mean, prostitutes do do something like that i think most prostitutes do it because they have to they have yeah, a, a drug addiction to feed right, or right. whatever but no i don't my, think they enjoy it no are you kidding me? And you're delusional if you think they do. But there are some other things you can do, right? I mean, so for do them, you want to go mind, work? Probably do you want to go work money. at McDonald's when you have when you have no Would education? Would I rather have sex with a stranger or work at McDonald's? And Is for, that what you're saying? You know what? For some women, it's much easier to have sex with a stranger. That's what I'm saying. So right. are they sexual deviants? No, they're not enjoying it. Sexual deviants enjoy it. They're not enjoying it. They're doing it. They're it's a means to an end. They're doing it to make money. Whether they have a drug addiction. Or whatever. They, there is a need for that. It's not a want. Okay, so his sister, right, became a prostitute. Yeah. And his dad went away for rape. Is his dad still alive? Did I don't he know. get anything else? Did something happen? Did something happen to him? We, like he's still in prison or something? His brother got a life without parole. His, his brother, for what? What did he do? He killed, he murdered a friend in a drug deal. Uh, a friend of his. So but... do you think Gilliard had drug problems? All right, so, so we didn't cover this. I don't think this. so. We didn't cover this, but... In oh, that Pierce yeah. Morgan, he had so his his home was a little rinky dink house. Well, I want to say rinky dink because now you're criticizing people who have you know smaller homes. And I have a small, parts. I have a small ish house. You do not. You have a freaking mansion. <laughs> you have a McDonald's big mansion going on. I don't. So it's all right. Had, so anyway, he has a. Um, it's a smaller. It's house, a modest right? house. He has a modest house. Yeah, and then I think the neighborhood's rough because he's not that far from where all these girls were. Walking the streets, They're not street walk. It's a street walking neighborhood, you know, like in the rough. You section. saw the neighbors on serial killers, though. They yeah. they weren't they they looked middle class ish. I mean, they were white. They looked. So are you assuming that white is middle class? No, but I'm saying they they. It's not like he was in the hood. Uh, yeah, it kind of was. Yes, it was. You think? Yeah. If you when, remember that Google view that they had. Yeah, it wasn't far it's, at all. There's factories. And it said it was less than a uh, two miles. It was less than a two mile radius from anyway, his home where Truce so, Truce yeah, Avenue So it's is. a modest home. And what kind of vehicles did he have? He had Mercedes. And not just and one. And he would trade he up. Had like eight or nine of, he ten had five. of them. He had was five. It five. And then he had a very rare and this Mercedes that was over a hundred thousand dollars. The eighties and nineties, right? Um, that one was in two thousand four. So the year he was arrested, he had that rare one that was a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So he said he traded up, traded up, and he would trade up every type year. Of thing. He said every year he would trade up. So he's probably doing like what's that called? Flip. No, when you lease when you lease a car, he was probably leasing them because he said he would trade up every year, and that's what you do, right? Isn't that how you lease the? Uh, uh, after the years, after the lease is up, the use, lease is like usually three Two years. years. Oh. I think it's three. But you have five of them. Yeah, his wife had one. He had one. Yeah. And then they had three extras, I guess. I don't know, even know where he parked them. I mean, they have pictures of them. Yeah, so how do you get that? I don't know. He started working for, he started working as a garbage man in 1986. 
Within two years, he was promoted to supervisor. So since 88, he was a supervisor. He worked there from 88 until his arrest. Supervisors, probably a lot of them, probably aren't making six-figure incomes. They're probably just not. And I don't know what his wife was doing. But yeah, I mean... Even if you're making a hundred grand, Plus, he's probably a spending year. some money on these prostitutes. He's probably getting kill every no, single one. No, he's not one. because he's killing them. <laughs> yeah, but he's, he's, he's paying them and then taking his money back. One. He probably didn't kill everyone. He might not pay them. He probably so you think he had, the service first and then pushed so you, him out of the car and burned out. So you think he had sex with prostitutes that he didn't kill? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Why do you say that? Because, because. You're missing the point of when he started this. He didn't start it. He, he didn't start it when, uh, you know, right off killing. It wasn't It's not the killing thing. It's the sexual thing. It's a sexual thing, right? He has to, you know, get rid of the poison, right? He has to find people to get rid of the poison. But he, if he, oh, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's as simple as just having sex. Why does he have to kill him? You think, you think he went out and found a prostitute. Had sex with her first time he's ever had a prostitute and killed her. No, I think um, just like the Grim Sleeper, that that guy, whew, that guy had sex like with so many women, like hundreds of women, but he didn't kill them all. They're still around talking I'm about saying, him. I'm saying, so yeah, I think no, I think I think you're right. I think he probably did have sex with prostitutes he didn't kill. So why did he kill some of them? I don't know. That was it. Eighty six. He had like four of them, right? Didn't he kill four in yeah, that's, one year? Eighty six is when he kind of let loose. In the eighties, he was very active. In the eighties, yeah. I'm thinking because items were missing from some of the victims. Items that friends knew that they always had on them were missing. You know that he took a trophy. Oh, you think it's a trophy? Well, most serial killers take trophies, and that's why those things were missing. Police went to his home, but they never found this stuff. They did find some stuff. So police went to his home on Kenwood Avenue, hoping to find souvenirs or trophies from the victims. They reported that they seized audio tapes, video cassette tapes, and a mini cassette recorder. Returning on Saturday with a warrant, so we're still back in 2004, uh, police seized a gray floor safe, a key, a combination lock, a computer, shoes, bras, and a pair of women's panties. And from those items, there was DNA of the victims on those items. So those items did belong to them. Yeah, but these, these but items don't... aren't, they're not valuable stuff. The ring, remember the ring was missing. The, no, it was ones... fake. It had a fake diamond. I don't think he stole, I don't think he was robbing them. Well, maybe he was. Maybe that's how he got his money. Maybe he robbed people because he did have a burglary well, charge. I mean, these are prostitutes. They're probably not having a whole lot of stuff on them. No. Right? I mean, they might have some cash from the previous Johns and Gilliards, but probably not much, right? So, What do um... prostitutes do with their money if they make it through the night? They buy drugs or pay their. So you pimp. think they spend it like that? Oh yeah, most 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 of these prostitutes were. Do you were have drug experience addicts. in this? How, how do you know this? I watch a lot of documentaries. Oh dang! <laughs> that's that's all I can say. I mean, like I said, they're not they're not out being a prostitute because they wanted to be a prostitute. They're doing it because they have to to survive for whatever reason. Whether it's some like a. Pimp. So w- would you say it's the easiest way for them to make money? Easiest and quickest way to make money. It's dangerous. It's risky. Yeah, when you're living a certain type easiest. of lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, in my life, I never considered that, but I that's never been an option for me, and I don't know anybody that it has been. I don't know if you have to be kind of connected to someone that's in that kind of lifestyle to for you to even consider it an option, but I don't... I'm thinking it's probably like you have a friend, they do it, and they have some money and stuff like that. Right, and then they and get you, you and involved. And then they say, hey, go do this trick, and you'll get 50 bucks, and you get your stuff. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's kind of linked to the lifestyle that you live, and I don't... And then you do it once, right? How, how's it go when you do something? There's like three steps. You, you reject it, you hate it, you... You don't think much of it. And then the third one is you accept it, right? Mm. Isn't that how thing, things go? It's like you do something kind of bad, right? You go steal. The first time you go steal, hey, I hate myself, da, 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 da. Then, then the second time, or not the second time, but you do a little bit more and it's like, okay, it's just, it is what it is, right? Mm-hmm. And then the third step is you're, you're actually, in a way, you kind of enjoy it, right? Because you just know you I mean, it may get to that point with women that, yeah, they, they, I think anything, probably not just women. I I think anything in your life, eventually it becomes so normal that you think you're enjoying it because how else are you going to get up in the morning? You've rationalized. Right. You've rationalized the abnormality of what you're doing. And so I'm thinking he's probably done the same way. 
Yeah, probably. Probably most people. I mean. How was his first one killed? Strangula- all of them were strangulation. Yeah, I know. But them. the first one was like, okay, he accidentally did it. Let's say, say, let's just go through the scenario. He didn't mean to kill. He's been visiting prostitutes, getting rid of the poison. And then he accidentally like strangled her, right? No, because hands. he had already raped the 13-year-old girl. He had abused and terrorized his first wife. But he didn't kill him. I'm saying he didn't kill him. I'm getting to where the point he that he held that one couple at gunpoint while again. he raped her. I mean, I think that's just the escalation of his of Yeah, of those so I crimes. think the first death, the first death was probably an accident, right? So you follow me where I'm going with this story. Listen, listen, listen. You follow me where I'm going with this story. Yes, I'm listening. Right? So you accidentally kill this first person and then it's like, "Oh my goodness." What have I just done, right? And then the, that second step, you, you get to that next one. And it's like, oh, I've done this before. I didn't get caught. And it's like, okay, so it happens again. And then the third and fourth and fifth one, you know, might be like, okay, this is kind of like a thrill. You think that's what happens with these serial killers? They're not getting caught. Well, he's considered an, or, an unorganized thrill killer. Uh, so what? What are you saying? What does that mean? I mean, yeah, there's there's some thrill there. Yeah, absolutely. He's getting something from it or wouldn't keep doing it. But but do you think that anybody can get to that level? With with killing people? Yeah. I mean, if you do Not it, normal people. you don't get caught. And, and then and then, a couple times later, it's like, okay, it's just, it is what it is, right? And then That's some people have like trips the and then it's like, it's, it's like, no, you can just, you can just do it. And like, you remember no that, remember the Iceman tapes where he yeah. was like supposedly this contracted killer or whatever and he... He, it was like nothing to him. It was like when I take out the trash, it was like that's how he, I, I wheel it to the curb and he kills people. It's like it was like no big deal yeah, to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but with some of this, it's almost got to be more than that. You almost got to seek it. I think you have to be. Right, because that was kind of his job. That was that guy's job, right? What? This, the, the ice man, the ice pick. He was supposedly, a mafia guy, yeah. right? Yeah, supposedly. So, so, but I don't think he went around I just killing people. I think a lot of the stuff people. he says is just BS. Okay, but I don't think he just went around killing people. Oh, no. Mm-mm. But this guy, this Gillier, and maybe some of these other people, they get to that point where it's their thrill, it's their it's their adrenaline junkie thing, and they and they can just, they just go and do it, right? I think most people that become serial killers or even killed one person or even two people are. I, mean, I don't know why this guy didn't hide it though. I don't know why this guy didn't hide the bodies or try to get rid of them or something. And not only that, but he he doesn't admit to anything, and he thinks DNA is a joke. He thinks DNA. Well, he didn't means... grow up with it, right? He didn't grow up with it. No, obviously, and he's. I mean, somebody says DNA to you. When, you know, like when you were younger, and somebody said DNA, it's like it's something you studied in science class and crap like that. I was like, okay. I mean, I can but tell he, you facts, and prison. you don't believe me, so huh? it's kind of the same thing. I can Just tell because you... you say it doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> Here we go. Yep. See, it's like I can have. But I'm saying, okay, so somebody says, picture. okay, DNA did it, but if you didn't grow up. With that you don't you don't know. understand what DNA is and how it links and yeah. how yeah no I or the I get accuracy that. or, or right and, it, and right? He, he said oh it's those cops those cops the cops you know, set and him then, up and then and Pierce Morgan said well, why do you think the cops would do that I don't know they just do you know type of right. thing right yeah so because he doesn't have he doesn't have his alibi right but I don't I I still it makes absolutely no sense do you to think me. he started killing these these women when his sister became a prostitute no his sister I don't know when his sister became a prostitute actually. yeah so do you think there's some links like you're a prostitute right, I'm done with prostitutes I don't know maybe maybe there's some interesting kind of... that most of these prostitutes were white there's one black one three and there's three there's three uh-huh there's pictures three look like they're all white they were Except all but the three mm-hmm Three black and and then all the rest are white. Maybe it's got to be something to do with the prostitutes too, because he's not killing other people well, besides prostitutes. It's yeah, but street walkers. How many cases have I we gone over? Easy, though. They're easy, easy targets. They're they're called soft targets. These women, they're gonna get in the car with you, because they're they're they gotta make money, and they can yeah. try as hard yeah. as they can, even with like like Gary Ridgeway, the Green River Killer. I mean, that dude was. Okay, I don't know how, as a prostitute, you cannot think that dude was creepy, but apparently they didn't. And they knew, you know, there was a serial killer well, killing think, prostitutes, I, and they still would get in the car with I them. Know, and he was but creepy. I think they put it in their mind. They have to separate that out. They put that but, aside. But you'll, they but you'll hear money. the interviews of the ones that either survived a, an attack or you don't were a prostitute to them, you. and they think, think you. you go through all these things in your head. You know, he has to have this, he has to have that before they'll get in the car, but then they get in the car with them. All right, so let's say you go swimming out in the beach, and the day before, somebody got attacked by a shark. Does that mean you don't go out in there anymore? Yeah, absolutely. I don't go out. Uh, no. Because you don't do it anyway. I don't even know why I'm asking you that question. <laughs> That's a bad example. But I'm, I'm just saying, people still go out in the beach. You know, they still go out in the water. Yeah. 
right? Even the next day, even the next hour. If you're addicted to drugs, it's not something you can turn off and on. Like it's a consistent thing. You wake up thinking how you're going to get high. You go to bed. Yeah, because it's, maybe it's you not going to happen to me. That's you... not going to happen to me. I'm not going to get into that, that bad guy's car, right? The, the, the odds, the risk, the risk reward. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not so sure with him with with Gilliard because he seems he's super soft spoken and he doesn't come off creepy to me at all like he just doesn't come off creepy Gary Ridgway was beyond creepy the BTK Dennis Rader he was creepy so I can see where women they would get in the car but I'm sure they've seen so many types of people oh, yeah. maybe they can't even determine who's creepy and who's not creepy at some point you know well I guess you gotta be a little creepy to do that stuff anyway right Oh, yeah. On April 29th, 2004, a grand jury indicted Gilliard on 12 counts of murder. He claimed his innocence of all these crimes, and he denies meeting any of the victims. And you'll see, I wish I could get a hold of the interrogations. Oh, actually, kind of, I don't. But they do have snippets on the episode with Pierce Morgan of the interrogation right after he was arrested. I couldn't find it anywhere online, the the interrogation in its, in its entirety. But almost every question asked, he says, not to my knowledge. Did you know so-and-so? Not to my knowledge. Did you have sex with so-and-so? Not to my knowledge. I think you would know if you had sex with someone. I mean, would that just not be a no? I find it weird even the way he answers. Like, not well, to my knowledge. Maybe he didn't know their names. I know, I mean, but this could have been other interview. Do, if they're have showing you ever you had a sex picture. with a prostitute or, or, a, or a, have you ever had sex with a woman that you didn't know their name, right? And and he said, yeah, you know. And then so he's thinking, well, it could have been, but I didn't know her name, you know, just some. But what if you have a picture and you are saying, I don't know that person, and maybe you don't because you don't know their name. I don't well, know maybe you don't know the name. Maybe it's but an older picture, say, right? You then, ever seen those pictures? Sometimes they're like real innocent oh, yeah. looking girl. Yeah. And then the one that's that's over here is like the same girl, but she's like all broke out and all messed up and stuff like that on drugs. The hair's all messed up. Mm-hmm. It's sometimes, kind of, you know, is that the same person? Okay. But then if someone shows you that picture again and says, have you had sex with this person? And you say not to my knowledge. If you know that you're not having sex with prostitutes, you would say no. You wouldn't say well, not I, I to would my say knowledge. Not to my knowledge. No, that's what I would say. Are that, you that's, serious? That's what you would yeah. say if someone says, you see a picture of If I of someone, did it, let's say I did it, I would say, oh, not to my knowledge. I I didn't recognize that person. It was dark. If you serious, okay, they show you a picture and you really have no idea who that person is. Why would you say, and they say, have you had sex with this person? And you're because like, you're not lying that, that way. Person. In, in my, it, no, I'm, I didn't have sex with them because I don't even know them. He didn't say that. He right. Said, not because, to my knowledge. Exactly. You're missing what he's saying. He said, not to my knowledge. I don't recognize that person. I could have. I know, but it's not a so normal he reaction. Cotton. If you didn't do something, you get... Yeah, but he... You don't you know defend the... defend yourself. But you if you've done something, inventory. you want them to okay. think you don't. You didn't do when, it. When he's pulled in, was he married? In that interview, was yes. he married? Yes. So what would you say? I don't... You know, not to my knowledge. That's I would what say you're no. Say. I would say no. I've not had sex yeah, with but, that person. In the other questions that you might not have seen, it might have been, did you have sex with prostitutes and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I did. I kind of messed around with my wife or something like that. Was this one of, oh, not to my knowledge. I, you know, I can't tell. Type no, of I, thing. I get why he said it, but that's, to me, it looks very guilty. I can see him saying, I don't, not to my, I don't know that person. Yeah, so to my maybe knowledge, I can see that. But when someone specifically it, says, did you have sex with them? And he says, it not to my like knowledge. It's like you, a lawyer would tell you to say. That's what exactly. It sounds, like. it sounds like when you're interviewed. But in, even um, when you're innocent, you still, you know, want to say certain things that, you know, they're going to try to catch you. Right. Right. It's not like an innocent person never gone to jail or did, you know, got busted for something they really didn't do. So we, we did talk about how they got his DNA, and then he claims that they didn't have his DNA because he was told that that DNA sample he gave in 1987 was destroyed in 98. But law enforcement did say that in 2004, when he was arrested, he did give a saliva, hair, and blood sample. So he maintains that 
police have no evidence against him because he obviously doesn't believe in DNA. He might think the world is flat too. I'm not sure. He's described as neat and tidy and well organized. And at the time of his arrest, like we mentioned, he had five Mercedes, one costing over 100000 He had a Rolex, a real Rolex, and the platinum credit cards and was married to Jackie for over a decade. She did divorce him, however, in an uncontested divorce in 2006. All but one victim showed signs of sexual intercourse around the time of their death. So they do believe that he didn't rape these women, that they consensually had sex with him, and then he killed them. That's where the raping thing still kind of boggles my mind. So in 2006, Gilliard is charged with the February 1989 death of Helga um, Kruger, which, by the way, she was the one that nobody knew. They couldn't find anybody that knew her, and she was from Austria. She was the 13th victim. The trial was delayed until March of 2007. Gilliard pled not guilty on all charges. And on March 16th, 2007, Gilliard was convicted of six counts of murder. And those were for Catherine Berry. She was 34. Naomi Kelly, 23. Ann Barnes, 36. Kelly A. Ford, 20. Sheila Ingold, 36. Carmeline Hibbs, 30. He was acquitted of killing Angela Mayhew due to insufficient evidence. So Angela Mayhew is the one that they didn't find semen in her or on her. She's the one that had the hairs that were on the turquoise sweater that matched other victims. Hairs that were on other victims. So, I mean, he probably killed her and just didn't, you know, finish or something. And that's why they didn't find Mm. it. Or he did it somewhere else. And then, unfortunately, seven were not ever brought to trial. So he was never charged for the deaths of Stacey Swafford, 17, Gwendolyn Kazine, 15, Margaret Miller, 17, Debbie Blevins, 32, Helga Kruger, 29, Paula Beverly Davis, 21, who we didn't talk about her. They thought he had murdered her. She was found actually along Interstate 70 in Ohio. And she had been strangled and everything kind of fit his M.O., And she was from Missouri, but she was actually found in Ohio. They suspect that he killed her, but I don't know if the evidence is strong enough. And then there is an unnamed victim that is 23, and law enforcement won't say much about that one either. In 2007, Gilliard was found guilty and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And I would suggest that you watch the documentary with Pierce Morgan. It's it's a good interview. There's not really a whole lot else out there about him in terms of a video because he has been quiet all of these years. He still maintains his innocent, still says they have no evidence against him. I don't know. He didn't come off as a real cold-blooded kind of killer. No, he didn't. I think that's why maybe they they kind of let their guard down with him because he was short-ish for a man, 5'8". I mean, that's kind of short. And he had that soft, you know, kind of voice. Yeah. He didn't probably seem very intimidating and nobody at that point had any kind of description of the serial killer that had been on the loose you know they didn't have any description or sketch or so nobody nobody knew who he was nobody knew what he looked like every time they got in a car they were taking a chance and he just really did seem like completely under the radar and it doesn't seem like there was any women that survived So if there were prostitutes that he just had sex with, I mean, I think that they would have come forward. But then again, in that kind of lifestyle, in that kind of life, in that they say he tried to kill me. I don't. Yeah. But I mean, we don't know that there's survivors. That's the kind of. Well, that's the problem. And not only that, I mean, I don't see prostitutes running to the cops for help, you know. Yeah. So even if there were, I'm not sure that they would have come forward. And and I think only when you kind of leave that lifestyle is when you can actually, you know, like that one woman they interviewed, she had been a prostitute at that time. Well, she was very far away from that life at that point. And so I think that's probably the only reason why she would even talk about it. Right. You know, she was no longer in that kind of life. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode and stay safe out there. And visit us on motruecrime.com. Be good. And if you can't be good, be careful.